Uh, so I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, trained as a mechanical engineer both in uh, school and also in industry. I worked for about eight years uh, in industry doing medical devices, energy systems, and humanoid robots, uh, and uh, some smartphone development. Um, and this is my PhD work here, so lots of machine design. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the mechanical design requirements are for, uh, for your program. So just kind of a quick overview. Um, basically, it's to prevent things from breaking. Uh, and there's some, there's some basic processes that I like to go through, which is really just kind of laying out, my, helping me understand what it is I'm actually trying to design. So that's conceptual sketches, looking at understanding what the load path is, trying to figure out where the loads are actually moving through the structure, and then actually calculating all the forces. Uh, and doing the actual stress calculations to see what's it, how everything is actually going to perform. And then finally, the tolerance stack up means you know, uh, keeping track of all the precision of all the components that you're using so that when you go to bolt it all together, it actually bolts together. And really, just all this is just part of bookkeeping. It's just keeping track of all these things so you can go back and reevaluate these things. And one of the, the main things that happens is a lot of times people are concerned about how uh, strong something is, they're afraid it's going to break. But usually mechanical design, what I find is you're actually usually more concerned about stiffness. How, how stiff is the structure that you're, you're making? Is it going to be flopping around and bending and hitting things and causing collisions with things? Especially if you have rotating machinery. Rotating machinery has uh, rotational inertia that can cause accelerations, that can cause things to start to get wonky and start flopping around and then they start to collide with things and that's usually when you have real problems. Um, so the next page I'm going to jump into kind of what it's specifically asking. I don't know if you've all had a chance to look through it. So you have the, the zero G booklet. So I'm going to kind of dive right into uh, just a few of the sections. It's all around 3.8.1 uh, or so is kind of like the main thing where you need to actually keep track of uh, all of your free body diagrams and your loading conditions. And so what does that mean? That's like, so when we want to try to, whoops, all right. Um, we want to calculate the forces that are in both the structure and the fasteners uh, to be sure that they can withstand the forces and stresses actually of, uh, of our system. So I should have put it on this slide now that I'm looking at it. So have you all heard of stress? Do you know the term stress versus force? So stress is actually, uh, I don't have it here, it's force divided by area. So it is not just the force in the material, but it is the force per unit area of material. And that's actually, what it means is like, so a knife blade. So you, you have a spoon and you want to try to cut through something and it doesn't cut very well because you're pushing down on the, the broad face of a spoon, say you're pushing into butter, for instance. And you're pushing down and you've got this large area that's underneath that, that, uh, that spoon. That means your stress, what, can I write in here? Yeah. Why don't I just write up this equation real quick? So, well. They never are very dark. So stress is equal to force over area. If your area is large, the stress value is gonna be low. Meanwhile, if you say take a knife, which has a very narrow area, you're actually going to have a very high stress, just like you can imagine. Like the stress is gonna, with a knife, you can cut right through the butter, but with a spoon, it's actually still hard to cut through through butter. So this is actually what we really care about. And um, there's something I think I have it later, but there's something called a, a stress curve of most materials. And there's something called stress and strain. Strain is basically how much something's elongating and stretching out. And as you can imagine, some things can stretch more before they break than others. And that's what this curve here is showing you, is this is how much it's some object is. If you're stretching it, say so this end is fixed. If you're stretching it out this way, there's some cross-sectional area of it. It's straining and it's going to change to some new length as you pull on it. That's moving along this curve and it's going to have some sort of stress on it. And if you go, if you strain it too far, you can reach a point where when you, when you release it, it doesn't necessarily come back to its original shape. 
And that's the yield stress. And I'll get into it a little bit more in a moment, but I just felt like it was kind of important to talk about this. You can imagine if you go beyond that, you go into some sort of ultimate stress zone where you're basically breaking the thing and the thing's collapsed, uh, falling apart. So in your calculations, we're concerned with what is our allowable stress. So our allowable stress versus our expected stress. That is our factor of safety. And that's ultimately what the zero G folks want to know is, what safety factor do you have? How, how, many, how likely is it for this thing to break? And that allowable stress is up to you to define. If you have something that's, say, rotating machinery or vibrating machinery, it's a cyclical load, fatigue life becomes really important. And you need to look up what the fatigue stress of your material is. If, you're, if it's just something where it's, for instance, this is an object here that is uh, some object with mass that's bolted onto, this is the, the plane of the plane, the plane of the plane. <laughs> where you're going to be bolt fixing this thing down. In this case, you're probably expecting this to just be static loads. And so this is probably going to be uh, maybe a yield stress or an ultimate stress. I usually use yield stress for everything. Yield is this part, this point right here, where it's starting to, starting to bend, but is going to return to its original shape. Uh, if you go beyond that, you know, you're going to start having failures. And then you're going to, it may be hard to unbolt your thing, for instance, if you're starting to bend bolts. Um, so there's forces and there's moments. So probably everyone knows F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, a moment is slightly different. That's a force times some distance. And those can actually get very high very quickly. And what that means is you've got this object here. It's, it's some mass and say it's on some pedestal of some sort. And the plane, and there's some acceleration. It's either due to gravity, the plane's going up or down or wherever it's going. There's some acceleration and in this case, there's a shear force, which is just this thing accelerating this way. But there's also a bending moment due to this distance, that the center of gravity, there's basically a force vector right up here. But it has to be attached down by these two bolts down here. And when it accelerates, it both shears and bends. And this bending is called a moment. And that moment can get very high very quickly. And that's one of the things we need to look at for actually uh, defining the stress. So the reason you need this is one, you should do, do this for any, any sort of thing you're trying to design because you want your thing to survive. But two, uh, in order to fly, you need to satisfy some of these engineering requirements. And so they're asking for free body diagrams of the geoload conditions. So what that means is a free body diagram is, oh, maybe these pens are better over here. Um, Free body diagram is an accounting of all of the stresses that are on your object. So if you've got some uh, object sitting on the ground, just on Earth, and has some mass, it has some mass and it has some acceleration, which is gravity. Everything, me standing here right now, I'm accelerating towards the center of Earth at 1G right now, Earth's gravity. And so free body diagrams, look something like this. There's some mass here, and there's some reaction force here. And this is the force due to gravity. All right, sorry, this is, the, this is the acceleration due to gravity, and this is some reaction force that's keeping me from flying through the floor right now. So when you're doing these things, I think I have it drawn up on the previous side. I said, uh, sum of forces, uh, you want, generally we're looking at statics here. So sum of forces is equal to zero, meaning we're not going anywhere. Uh, and then that's equal to mass times our acceleration, which in this case happens to be gravity. Uh, and I'm going to say, you should always set coordinate systems. So here I'm going to call this x and y. So I'm saying that I'm accelerating neg in the negative direction. It doesn't really matter which direction. You just have to be consistent with your directions, and it will all add up. Uh, and there is some force going up. And so now you can calculate that your force is equal to mass times gravity. So that makes sense. That's a very simple, like the simplest way you could possibly set this up. Now if this were at an angle, there's some sort of friction that's keeping the box from sliding down. Uh, or if you're up higher, like on uh, in the, my drawing on the previous page, you'll have a uh, Uh, let's see, actually, I'll we'll put our little bolts here. Uh, 
Now, if your, if your acceleration is now in this direction, so there's some acceleration here, and in this case, what they're saying is forward, aft, down, lateral, up of nine Gs. So that's gravity, but it's now nine times gravity. Sorry, my A's and G's all look the same there. And what you want to do is, what it's asking you to figure out is, what are the forces on these screws? What are the forces on your structure? And so you're going to do this similar accounting. But in this case, and here you can choose where you want to set your, your Y and X. Maybe we're doing it here now. You're going to want to sum your forces in the X direction and in the Y direction. And you might even want to sum the moments about one of these points. And you can choose where that is. Maybe you choose it right here. So maybe we'll actually move the, uh, I'm going to move the coordinate systems right in the center here. So in this case, you're, you're going to have some, man, what, dry erase never works. I've yet to find one that actually works. Just in general. They're always dry. All right, we'll try again with one of these. So uh, has anyone, have you guys, are there any mechanical engineers or physics majors in here? OK, so you've all done free body diagrams and everything. So maybe I don't need to get into all this stuff. But basically, the point is you really want to be sure that you're summing all your forces and summing moments. I think it's definitely still worth it, Matt, because maybe three or four of us have been up there. Okay. Our backgrounds, philosophy backgrounds, and things. All right, so you can, you can ask some of your mechanical engineering uh, fellow students also for more detail on this. Mm -hmm. But basically, you're going to sum forces. So in the x direction, um, what we have is we've got, again, mass. And positive is this direction times acceleration. In this case, we're going to say 9g. And we want to calculate, we want to draw out maybe another color. We want to think about where are our reaction forces. There may be, say in this case, we have two bolts and we're just doing planar. There may be two locations here. And actually, ultimately, what you want to do is, so I kind of do one kind of messy one sometimes to kind of figure out where everything is. And then you really want to break it down into each of the objects. And here's our object with this plate. It has these two little holes in it. And in this case, we're going to see that there is, oh my goodness. There we go. There's some sort of reaction force. Uh, I don't know, I'll call this F1Y, F2Y. And there's also a shear force here in the x direction on both of these guys. And sorry, there was this, uh, we have an acceleration here. So basically you kind of break each of these down and then technically you would even go and look at each of the screws that you have that are holding your little fixture down. And you're going to look at what the, what the stress is on each of those individual screws. And in this case, you would have, say, uh, there's probably a pull up, the FY force, maybe here. Uh, or it's actually here. Or maybe it's here on this screw. You can choose where you want to. Usually, it's the screw thread that's going to rip out more than the head of the screw. Um, and there's also this, uh, actually, if we drew it that way, it's going to go the other direction now reaction force. This is actually going to be the shearing force due to that X force. And so you're going to calculate these guys. So here I'm going to say there's, I don't know how many screws I'm going to use yet. So I'm going to say N number of screws times the force of X. And uh, that's actually the negative direction. Uh, similar thing here. Right now there's some sort of, we said there was some Y force. So now um, some mass. But actually we're saying we're moving in this direction. So there are Maybe there's no forces here. Or if we're going to go, we actually want to go through and draw one of these out for each one of these conditions. So with the forward, aft, down, lateral. Because in, when we're just accelerating this way, there is no reaction. There is no vertical reaction force here. But when we're accelerating this way or this way, all of a sudden there's a very large one. So you're going to want to keep track of whether or not that actually exists and where that is. So I'll just call this acceleration here. And again, um, depending on how many screws you're using, you're going to be looking at the forces. Now, the next thing is this guy. 
So this is, there's some bending moment that's going to happen here. And there's actually two distances that we're going to want to be concerned with. There's the height. Maybe I should go back to that previous drawing so we can see it a little bit more. Oops. Uh, so there's a height and then there's some distance r. And that r is the distance from the center to the screw. And that's important for figuring out what the moment is and ultimately what the stress is from on each one of those screws. So, so there's actually, uh, so that separates, so there's the moment just on say like this bending joint here. And in that case it's gonna be your force, which we figured out was moment times Oh, I'll just go to acceleration here. So we said acceleration equals 9j. Moment times acceleration times some height. Now this is at this origin point right here. The next thing you'll actually end up doing, so this is for just kind of figuring out the, the overall free body diagrams. But then when we're trying to figure out what the forces are on the individual screws, what we realize is uh, this moment that's being applied here actually has to be taken up by the distance from these screws. So we'll do a second set of calculations for this individual screw here. And in this case, what we're going to say is um, there was some distance out to here from where this force is being applied. Uh, that moment, let's see. Sum of moments uh, about this origin point here is now actually equal to the number of screws we have times the distance that this force is being applied to. Uh, this force y plus our uh, our calculated moment, which was here. I guess I should have shown here. There was some sort of uh, reaction moment here that is actually preventing this thing from toppling over, and it's that. Let's call it, I guess, mo. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry messing up my nomenclature here. Uh, MO, and again, if we want it static, we don't want the stuff moving, so you set it equal to zero, equal to zero. So here's a way, so this is how you can calculate uh, maybe what, you can, you have a couple knobs here. You can turn your R, you can make this platform stick out further, or you can change the number of screws you have that are gonna increase the number, of, uh, that are gonna affect uh, what the, the forces are of those individual screws. And so you might, you can kind of choose which one it is, but basically the n times r ratio is going to help you determine what, um, what you can choose which one of these knobs to turn, whichever one's easier for your design or whatever is convenient in one way or another, uh, and that's going to then ba balance out these forces here. And ultimately that's also going to be dependent on what your uh, stress is. So your stress, depending on what your factor of safety you wanted was, uh, your stress is going to be this force over area. And so you're, you get to mess with all of these things to figure out which knobs you want to turn. If you want to reduce the, you can reduce the force by moving the, by increasing the number of, I guess you could do it the other way. That's more of how I'm explaining it right now. That looks a little easier to keep track of. So you can, you can reduce the force by either increasing n or increasing the distance. So the number of bolts are how far apart they are. And then what that means is that then tunes what the stress is on the individual bolt. And so, and when ultimately you're concerned of your factor of safety, according to these guys, usually you're just concerned with the stress, but we will convert the factor of safety so they know. And you wanna keep track of all of these things so you can report it. Um, it's just whatever you're saying is allowable, so call it maybe your yield over what you expect. So this is your expected calculation. And this comes from some sort of material data sheet of some sort, uh, depending on what materials you're using. And so you can go through all of this for each configuration and then keep track of all that. It can even be hand sketched. It's nice if you can do more engineering drawings, um, but that's ultimately what they're requiring. And so what they're saying is you want to, you want to track all these calculations. And uh, that way you can reference it later. So they actually want you to split it out into what each component is, what its mass is, 
what material it's made out of and the allowable load or the allowable stress for each one of those materials. So if you keep track of that as you're going through your design process, you'll be able to kind of feel, fill out all these things. Uh, and then they actually ask you to also do uh, one additional calculation, which is the one bolt out calculation, which is effectively looking at, okay, what kind of factor of safety did you have? So N over here, where I had said, you calculated this out, you probably want to throw a couple extra N, a couple extra bolts on there. In case one of them comes out, you can verify that your expected stresses are still well below your allowable. So, you know, if you have a factor of safety of 10, you've got nine times, you pull out one bolt, you still have nine times as much uh, strength as you might have expected. And then again, uh, actually drawing out, this is a uh, 3.8.4 is a table, but some of these things are kind of better in drawings, in my opinion. So the, the table is just basically telling you, showing that you did the calculation, uh, where that location is on your assembly, so showing where the drawing is, and then what your ultimate factor of safety is. And all of this is really to keep you safe, because you're gonna, all of you are going to be floating around in this, uh, on this plane. and. Uh, if, if someone's if someone's hardware breaks, it's going to go flying and smack someone uh, in the head, or you're going to, or you know, you, you could be other things like you may fall on your device, and you want to be sure you're not breaking your device, which then causes a bunch of things to go loose. Um, so I, I might have jumped into the calculations a little too soon, but let me pull a step back and let uh, just kind of work through kind of the process that I like to go through. So I usually start with conceptual sketches. It can be anything from a simple little uh, line drawing to to get started, to start, I always end up going to some sort of like isometric view. It's not really ISO, but ISO-ish. Just going 3D kind of helps me understand things. And give yourself little notes as you're going through this so that you can kind of figure out what it is that you're actually talking about. And so you can communicate with the rest of your team if you're on a team. Um, and it's just kind of good practice to go through. Uh, what you see here, I, I, I went through a whole handful of different design calculations as for a spring on the leg I showed you at the very beginning. And I, I, will, I urge everyone to try to come up with at least five different ways of solving the solution that you're trying to solve. Because your first idea may be the best, but it also may not be. And it's really good practice to force yourself to think creative. Like, think, like, like uh, Devo was saying, like, think upside down. You know, you're like, literally just turn it upside down and think about another way that you might be able to solve this problem. It's gonna be really helpful for, one, just brainstorming, and two, uh, you know, getting yourself out of some sort of uh, bind you might be getting into. So when we're talking about these designs, when you draw it all out, you, you may think you have the, the idea in your head and that's helpful, but for me anyway, I found that when I draw things out, it kind of helps solidify ideas and I can kind of see where problems are gonna be. And I do that long before going into 3D, like before I get into some sort of CAD program, because it's just, it's fast. It's really, really fast to sketch by hand versus in the computer you start to get kind of locked down by constraints of like if you're using SolidWorks, once everything constrained, and locked down, um, and that can really get in your way when you're trying to be creative. So speaking of locking down, the, the, the things that you really are most concerned about are think how things are going to move in space. And so you want to think about constraints. How are you actually locking something down and preventing its motion? So every object that exists has six degrees of freedom. It can move in the x, y, and z direction, and it can also rotate about each one of those axes. And if you, if you take the time to sketch things out and uh, really think through all of these constraints, all of these degrees of freedom, it can help you really kind of lock down your design. And know which ones you're trying to lock. All right, like, so that object there, you see the, the, the purple is kind of a, uh, this purple pyramid here is, say, the ground. And here's some object that it's able to move around. Right here, it's, you know, if I'm pinned, have this pin joint, it can't move in the, the X, Y, or Z motions, but it can rotate around all of those. And so sometimes you might make an object where it seems like it's connected. Like, it, you know, let's say you 3D printed two pyramids sitting on top of each other. It feels somewhat rigid, but as soon as you put any sort of loads on it, you might start getting bending there because you haven't rigidly constrained it. And so what you can think of is uh, there's this concept called exact constraint design or kinematic constraint design where you are, you can think of every time you make a constraint, it's only able to constrain purely axially. It's one line of contact. And what that means is you can, may have two objects that are constraining it, and the point where their imaginary 
constraint line aligns becomes your center of rotation, and that center of rotation can't move. But as soon as you lock down two points, we've now established that this guy is fully rigid in, in position. And, and, and so this is kind of a, you can get really mathy about it, but you can also be fairly geometric about it. And it can be really helpful because sometimes you think you may, you may want a mechanism or you may want a fully rigid device. And w for instance, if these are all locked up joint, pin joints here, if you're pushing and, pushing and pulling on this thing, you can imagine this whole thing is just opening and closing. And as soon as you constrain the degree of freedom that these guys have, it then becomes a fully rigid system. And it, become, it goes from a mechanism to a structure. And that, so those are, um, so it's helpful to go through this process as you're designing things because it's going to help you understand where the forces are and what types of motions you're going to get. So then when you're, as you're doing that, the next step is to consider the load path. So load path is this concept that when there's some object and there is force on it, that force has to travel through the object. And there's portions of the object that may or may not be loaded. Like this section up here of this object has no loading on it in this configuration. And so in fact, it, you could almost negate it and maybe you don't even need that, that set of material. Similar to like when you're sitting on a chair, um, you know, three points of contact establish a plane. That fourth one is just there because nothing's really flat and things, it's easy to make things um, more stable by separating the stability out. But at any given time, there may only be three of the legs actually in contact with load. So if you had like six or 12 legs, you, a lot of those may not even be in your load path. So this is uh, the drivetrain from the leg I built. And I'm just kind of sketching out the fact that in, when I'm in compression, I've got a load path that is passing through this structure, through this bearing, and back out the screw. But when I'm in tension, my load path is actually slightly different. It has to actually pass back through this guy, and it goes, actually goes through a different bearing on the way out because of the way these bearings are configured. So that's the kind of thing that it's really helpful if you're actually uh, taking the time to draw these things out and you realize that maybe some of your components are loaded differently. Even though it seems like it's just push-pull, should be the same thing. There's actually different load paths for these structures. And that is important in this design because I have screws here and I need to be sure that this whole piece doesn't shear off when it's loaded in a, a, t a tension direction. And had I not encountered that, I would have trouble. In fact, I have a student who's designing a next version of this right now. And that student was paying only attention to the torsion on the system and forgot the whole point that there is 3,000 newtons of force along the length here. And, and so that, that's why it's really important to kind of take the time to, to step through these things. So this is jumping back to the uh, stress-strain diagram I was trying to show here. Uh, there, are, there are axial loads there, and there are shear loads that you need to be careful on when you have screws. So the, the stress-strain curve, most materials has some, have some linear regime in here. This is mostly, and certainly metals and plastics do. And this is usually where we're designing. So our yield stress is basically in this zone here. Um, actually here they're showing yield stresses all the way up to here because yield, yield stress is often defined as 0.2% uh, of strain. So meaning if you pull the material and let it go and it, it will relax to within 0.2% of its original length. In that case, it's still considered um, elastic deformation. And that's the, the that's the, the slope of this curve, the stress versus strain, is the, what's considered the Young's modulus, or the modulus of elasticity of your material. That's how stiff your material is. And we can use that when we're trying to define what the, how much the material is going to bend or, or change shape when we're calculating. You'll see that on the next slide. Uh, when you have screws, there are a few different ways screws can fail. They can, they can fail and shear. You can literally just shear it right off. Uh, or you can pull them out. And the, I'm not going to get into those calculations right here, but uh, I recommend looking at a design book for those. Basically, all you're doing is you're saying, again, it's all about accounting for this area. Uh, if it's pull-out strength, then it's the area, projected area of the screw threads themselves, which is just an annulus. It's just a, um, if you've got your screw, there is, it has threads on it. And there's a major diameter and a minor diameter. And imagine these are threads coming out here. It's just the projected area of the threads. 
they have some width, let's call this area, and then the number of uh, teeth that you have in contact. And you usually never have more than about six teeth actually in contact. That's just kind of a, a general rule. Um, but you can use that for the pull-out strength. So like if you have a steel screw, a steel screw is very strong, but you're putting in plastic. The plastic may not be that strong. And so even though you have a lot of threads in there, that may not be nearly enough to actually take all the stress of your, of your pull-out. Uh, and then here in shear, there is, shear is, actually doesn't care about the threads. It cares about the cross-sectional. It's funny, it works for a second and then doesn't. It cares about this cross-sectional area in this screw. So if your screw continues down for a long ways, um, there is this area that you're actually shearing across, and that's the. Uh, and it, you may have either one of those or maybe two of those that can actually be taking the load, distributing the load from uh, from shear. And all that again is that that it's just adjusting what area you're using for calculating your stress. There are just slightly different curves for uh, shear stress versus axial stress, but for most materials we just assume axial stress counts. Now the next big thing is stiffness and bending. So this is, I would argue, most of the time when we're designing things, we're actually designing for stiffness, not strength. Though strength also accounts for that. And that's because you usually don't want things flopping around. And so, but different loading conditions have different stiffness. So bending is uh, a different calculation than axial. And what that means is in axial, it's all about the cross-sectional area and the modulus of el elasticity and how much of that material you have until you reach a buckling point. But bending, it actually really cares about the geometry. And this is really important, is that usually you're actually looking, you're, Usually the thing that is most uh, important is actually your bending stress, which is determined on this I term. This I is the second area moment of inertia. You see it also shows up in the sigma critical, which is the buckling strength, which as you can imagine, if you're pushing on something, like I had a nice little demo before, and maybe I don't have it with me right now. Something will work here. Sure. So a sheet of paper. This is one uniform piece of sheet of paper, right? So if I just try to push on it, it buckles very easily, right? I'm pushing down on this thing. But if I change the geometry, even just slightly, to say a big round thing, all of a sudden I can take way more load before I start to actually buckle this thing. What I just did was I changed this I, the second area moment of inertia, which are these calculations here. By actually changing this I term in any one of these, it's calculated slightly differently. In this case, I guess we're, um, we're more like this annulus here. By, by taking the, same, the exact same piece of material with the same cross-sectional area and just changing the geometry of it into something that has a much higher R in this case, much larger geometry. Uh, basically, I've, it's kind of similar to our moment calculation. I put the material further out and so it can support the stress greater, uh, I all of a sudden have a way greater stiffness in bending. So if I go back to this calculation here, exact same area, exact same material, but I have this I term here. Now there's also a length term, um, which has a big effect in bending and not quite as much in axial, but and also in this sigma critical. So they're all kind of dependent on each other, but in general, when we're thinking about materials, often people will say that you want a stronger material that we should use titanium instead of plastic or something like that, or, uh, or steel instead of aluminum. That's all cool, but really, but that, those are generally small variations in E. Like all aluminums all have the same uh, elastic modulus. Uh, steel is a little bit stronger than steel. Uh, maybe twice as much or three times as much stiffer than aluminum. But titanium is somewhere in between the two of those. So those, those values are maybe 2x, whereas I has these cubic and, and uh, to the fourth power, I forget what to the fourth power is called. It has these really big terms here for R. It's a much bigger knob than just changing the modulus of elasticity of your material. So you can get a lot more for just thin material.
for, uh, by changing the geometry rather than changing the material. It means you don't necessarily need to use super expensive materials, and you don't necessarily need to um, you know, change, change them out. You just need to change your geometry and really think through what is the load path and what is the geometry doing for me that's actually going to give me the type of support I actually want. And so there's, uh, in the back of the book of a lot of these uh, strength materials or design calculations, there's a lot of these types of calculations that can be helpful. These are bending beam calculations for, for instance, a cantilever beam. A uh, cantilever beam is just a beam that's, that's grounded on one end and free on another end. And you can see you can actually calculate what the deflection is going to be and what the angle is going to be at any given point. And that can give you a sense of whether or not you're going to have any sort of conflict. Uh, let's see. So these are some of the, so you're going to use all that again with these free body diagrams to sum up all your forces and sum up your moments and figure out uh, what your uh, factor of safety is, what your reaction forces, deflections, uh, and how much material you actually are going to need. So that's all of, this is a very quick jump into what all the different stresses are on these things. Uh, like Ariel was saying, there are entire textbooks on this stuff, so this is just a very narrow focus on it. Um, but there's one other thing, and that is tolerances and structural loops. So in addition to looking at the load path, you also want to look at what your tolerance stack up looks like. The reason I'm using all these pictures for my stuff is that I know there's no copyright issue. Um, but these are, I did a lot of work previously on how to assemble large structures out of lots of little pieces. And the tolerance stack is really important. Say you're trying to fit a bunch of pieces into, you've got some box, and you want to fit a bunch of little boxes into that. Well, there's some variation in the size of this actual box, as well as the variation in size of each one of these individual components. And you want to account for all of that variation to be sure that all of your parts are going to fit together when you go to assemble it. And the more little pieces you have, the potentially the longer, the larger that tolerance stack is going to be. This is why we often say in design for manufacturing, we want to actually reduce the number of individual components so that we don't have tolerances stacking up on top of each other that are going to cause problems for us later on. So in general, it's nice to kind of go with uh, monolithic components. Um, and, but, you also, but you have to keep in mind not just like how many different components you are, but what, are the, what is the manufacturing process you're using. If you're doing 3D printing, I think most 3D printers are somewhere around seven thousandths of an inch tolerance. So you're going to need to account for that. So every time you stack up, so say you printed out this guy, you're, there's some variation here that is you know, seven thousandths of an inch, maybe. And then each one of your components also has a variation of seven thousandths of an inch. And if you're trying to get a tight fit, you need to account for each one of those variations all the way up, meaning basically you need to sum up all of these tolerances and make sure this guy is wide enough that it can can account for everything. Now that can be annoying sometimes because sometimes you you need to put a big gap in there and so some of your parts are going to be loose and some of them are just barely going to fit. But that's the name of the game on these things. Or there's one other thing you can do which is again showing that you know if your tolerances are off you're trying to line up two things that need to be dead on you're almost never going to get that to actually work. So what you can do is you can actually modify geometry so that you can accommodate that. So the old pin and slot is, while not a purely kinematic constraint, it's very effective at aligning things. And so you can utilize that kind of concept in your designs. This goes all the way back to that first picture talking about constraint uh, and under identifying what are the, all the degrees of freedom. You can put one pin in, sure, everything's fine. We've locked down one pin. We're locked in the x and y direction. I'm assuming there's some plate behind it, so that's our z direction too. But it has free rotation around the, uh, I guess, in this case, uh, around this y-axis. So rather than putting a second pinhole in here that needs to be dead on, I'm going to put a slot in here that allows some variation in it. And so everything has been locked down here, but this end is still free to move around. By now putting this pin in here, I'm able to align it because I have some, I can accommodate variation here, but now it has restricted this range of motion. And this is used all over the place in consumer product design. Uh, and it can show up, sometimes it's just a pin and a slot, like you'll see if you have something that's like a clamshell design, you crack it open, you'll probably see this feature somewhere in there. Um, but it is, 
it's kind of like the kind of go-to way of solving this problem. But you can also do it with a different geometry. It doesn't have to be just a pin and a slot. It can be, you know, sometimes you'll see on structures they have, um, I don't know, I forget what it's called actually. There's like a, you can kind of have a, a, a lip that goes all the way around the structure. That's kind of an averaged version of this. Or you can do a lip on one side and, and some other constraint on another. You can get creative with how you're going about this. But it is really important to pay attention to this type of behavior in your structure so that you can get everything to fit. And it's really important. And in fact, I think all the way back in the one bolt out calculation, they're actually saying the one bolt out is not that a bolt broke or fell out. It's that the bolt didn't fit because your tolerances didn't add up. So this is a real thing that shows up all the time. If you've got some plate and you're trying to put a bunch of holes in there, it's really hard to get everything to line up just right. So line up one, and then the rest account for it by providing some sort of gap. So uh, that's basically all I've got for you. Uh, there's some additional references here that you might want to look at. Uh, I have a little rant on mechanical design on my website uh, that kind of talks about each of these things, which is basically stiffness is really what you're concerned about. And you want to use, um, uh, you want to pay attention to geometry more than material. In general, material also matters a lot, but it, you'd be surprised how far geometry can go to really fixing a lot of your problems. And then uh, statics of, mecha of mechanics and materials, it goes through all these calculations. And it's for relatively straightforward things, it's not, you don't have to go through the entire textbook now that you have just kind of a rough draft. Uh, I didn't get into dynamics really, but dynamics means you're actually gonna allow motion. Uh, if you're doing stuff with dynamics, then um, we can take a deeper dive on that, either with other students or possibly I'm able to help uh, though more so later in the semester than the beginning of the semester. And um, Fundamentals of Machine Component Design. This is uh, by far the best book you can possibly get, in my opinion. There's a couple of makers. Juvenal is one of the authors. Uh, I really like that book. I think it's pretty straightforward to understand. And it kind of it has sections on materials, um, some basics on statics and calculations and, and whatnot. And I can share these slides with you all also. Um, and then exact constraint, machine design using kinematic principles. Uh, it's a really good book for n just getting kind of a rough understanding of exact constraint design uh, without a bunch of math, because I don't like the math so much sometimes. Um, so that's all 